Hello everyone, welcome, warm welcome to this webinar uh, to present the SSR validations for multiple remote towers and automatic speech recognition. Uh, we have a tight uh, schedule and an exciting program for you today, so we'll uh, start right away. This is a uh, webinar that follows a physical uh, open day we had in Norway last November with more than 70 attendees. It was just before society closed down again, but we were lucky to have so many people here in Norway. Still, there were many that couldn't attend that webinar, that uh, physical open day. So we were asked to hold a webinar, which we do today. There are nearly 300 people registered for the webinar today, which is really exciting. And we have a very good uh, program for you today. So uh, good morning, good day or good afternoon to you, wherever you are in the world. This is the agenda we have. We will start with a short introduction by myself. My name is Martin Hasselknippe. I work in product management within Indra. Then we will have uh, some perspectives on multiple remote towers from uh, our partners Avinor and Hungaro Control. We will then go into ASR, which is automatic speech recognition uh, presentation by Georgi Balog and Viktor Horvat and uh, some video demos. Then we'll talk about the PGO5 validation platform with the video demonstration. And then we will hear about the execution of the validations. You see that we have a Q&A at the end of the webinar today. At the top of the HMI on your screen, you can find a, uh, an icon with a bubble question mark, which is a Q&A icon, and it's possible to write questions to, to our expert panel. Some questions may be answered in writing during the webinar, or some questions will be answered during the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. These are the experts that we'll present to you today. We have Jonare Pettersen and Tristan Blank Brud from uh, Avenor. We have Chaba Gergeli, Viktor Horvat, and Fanny Kling from Hungar Control. And my colleague uh, Georgi Balog and myself, Martin Asknippe from Indra. So I'll start right away with some introductions and uh, background for these validations. CESAR is a big uh, resource program uh, doing research and development within Europe. There's a lot of projects going into air traffic management programs in, within CESAR, and the validations we have done is within PJ05 Digital Technologies for Tower. Within PJ05, you can find two solutions. Uh, solution 35, Multiple Remote Tower and Remote Tower Center and solution 97, which again is split into two, solution 97.1, virtual augmented reality applications for tower, and 97.2, which deals with automatic speech recognition. So the two validations we have done so far, they deal with solution 35 and solution 97.2. So what is a multiple remote tower? Uh, remote tower in itself has been around for a while, and we see that in operations uh, many places in the world. But so far, it is uh, mostly single remote tower, that is a single controller with one airport. But multiple remote tower is looking at the ability for one controller to operate several aerodromes simultaneously. And then we mean simultaneously at the same time. You can have landing on one airport while you have a departure on another one and uh, some taxing aircraft on the third one. So it's it's really in, in parallel. And to be able to do that safely, of course, we have to go, go through validations like the validations we do in CESAR in an operational context. Uh, we did this in CESAR wave one two years ago, but now we also extended it with dynamic allocation. And that means that we are looking at the remote tower center with multiple airports, with multiple controllers and multiple working stations, and how you can allocate aerodromes to workstations according to the workload and the traffic demand for those airports, and then change and move an airport from one controller to another when that's needed. So this is the dynamic allocation of multiple remote tower. I mentioned that we did some of this work during wave one two years ago, 
But now in wave two, SSR PJ05 wave two, we have this solution 35 with two objectives. The first objective is the multiple remote tower planning tools for supervisor, and the second one is the uh, dynamic allocation of aerodromes. So there are two focus areas here, dynamic allocation, as I mentioned, how can you put aerodromes uh, correctly into controllers in a, in a remote tower center, but also looking at how a supervisor can help in this context. We have operational supervisors in large airport towers, and we have supervisors in area control centers, but supervisors for a remote tower center is something new, and we need to look at how the roles and responsibility can be in that context. So this is one of the validations we've done, and the other one about uh, solution 97.2 is about automatic speech recognition. This is a technical validation, while solution 35 is an operational validation. So this is looking more at the technology and how automatic speech recognition can be of help to the controller and how we can use it. Victor and Georgi will tell you more about that in a few minutes. So we've done two validations uh, periods so far. In September 2021, we had the validation with Avinor focusing on solution 35, the multi-remote tower. That was a real-time simulation where we simulated four aerodromes uh, by using a simulator system from Micronav, the best simulator. And then in uh, November 2021, we had a similar validation with Hungaro Control, also using a real-time simulator and, uh, and the same uh, setup as we did with the first one. But in this validation, we also included solution 97, the automatic speech recognition. The Avinor validation took place three weeks during September 2021. And the focus was on air traffic controllers and supervisors. We had six ATCOs and six supervisors attending during those three weeks. And there were people uh, from, with experience from large tower and small towers and supervisors with experience from towers and air traffic control centers. So we simulated up to three aerodromes simultaneously and well at one working position. And we looked especially at how we could move aerodromes between the working positions, both planned and unplanned, and unplanned in the event of emergencies or equipment failures. For the Avenir NOR validation, we also looked at how we could combine tower and approach in a multiple remote tower setting. Then in December, we had the Hungaro control validation where we had the two weeks in November 2021. This was in the middle of COVID situation. So we were able to conduct two weeks with two fully used RTMs. We used up to four aerodromes at the same time, but three maximum at one MRTM, one uh, multiple remote tower module. Uh, here we attended with six at goals and supervisors, and there was a full rotation of tasks, so everyone tried the different positions and also the supervisor position. Again, we tested the dyn dynamic allocation with planned and unplanned handover, and also dealt with emergencies and equipment failures. And in this validation, we included the automatic speech recognition. Show you now a short video about the Avinor validation and uh, and how that was conducted. We live in a digital era in which we quickly adopt new technologies to make life easier. Yet manual processes and visual observation, looking out the window, are still crucial for air traffic services at most airports. At Indra, we believe in progress. To improve efficiency of service, the Innova Tower System allows air traffic service officers to manage several airports from a remote location. Situational awareness is ensured by having all information and control systems integrated into a single user-friendly display. As part of an EU-funded CESA project, Indra and Norwegian Air Navigation Service provider Avinor have collaborated on research to further improve cost and operational efficiency. 
Avinor uses the Innova Tower System for remotely managing airports in the world's largest remote tower program. Together, we have successfully validated dynamic remote towers, allowing flexible allocation of airports between different working positions. In 2019, we validated that one air traffic controller can manage up to three airports from a single integrated working position. Now, we've taken it one step further. We allow controllers to move control of airports to different working positions. If something happens so you need to focus on a single airport, you can transfer the other airports to your colleague. This brings a new level of teamwork and operational flexibility to air traffic management. During this validation, we have uh, simulated the operation of three airports from one single working position, but we have also introduced aircraft emergencies and uh, bad weather conditions. Uh, and we have also focused on uh, the transfer of uh, airports from one working position to another and included in that the supervisor role in the control group. The experience is that uh, it's good to integrate all the functions into one single uh, working position and to have all the functions that's uh, needed for the controller. That uh, also helps us in organizing the, uh, the service provision in the future. Like many other countries, Norway has a lot of uh, smaller regional airports. They're operated by two to three controllers each. If we can do that in a remote tower center where one operator can operate three airports, three operators can operate nine airports, we can get a more flexible service, uh, cheaper service, and, and, not, and not, to, not to forget that uh, the work satisfaction for the controller, each controller actually will increase massively. The future is here. Embrace the progress. There we are. Then we will uh, continue to uh, hear from Avinor on their perspectives on multiple remote tower. So I give the word to Jonare Pettersen, program manager of the Avinor remote tower program. Uh, thank you, Martin. Um, let's then just start the presentation here. Um, yes, my name is uh, Jonare. I've been working with this program now for the last six years. Uh, and I'm going to give you a perspective on uh, on the remote tower program uh, and a multi uh, especially. So um, the journey that we have started on is really to get from a traditional tower with legacy system uh, and then moving that uh, service over to something that looks like this and and this is really a a journey not only to do remote but uh, as this uh, Cesar uh, exercise is all about it's to get eventually to the multi uh, use of the of the remote tower uh, system and um, this is much more than just replacing the out of the window view uh, if we were to take the um, existing tower systems and, and take them over to a remote uh, situation, just uh, putting cameras uh, to replace out of the window view, we will not be able to move to multi. The, the original tower concept do not adapt to multiple operations, at least not the ones that we have today. Uh, so with the remote tower program, we both needed to get remote, but also we needed to do what's what's necessary to eventually get to multiple. And that means also changing all the ATM systems uh, so that we could eventually then uh, take multi into operation. So why are we doing this? And, and as also mentioned in this video, um, uh, there are two main drivers for this from a, a business perspective. 
uh, we have a lot of old uh, tower installations. Uh, they are from the 50s, 60s, and uh, they really need to be uh, replaced, and it's quite costly to build new towers. So, so we had a, a large upcoming investment in the existing towers. But we also see that a lot of these towers have uh, not much traffic, and we could reduce the operational cost by introducing multi. Uh, this could also give us a more flexible service delivery to the airport customers and, and also increase the readiness when needed, for instance, for ambulance flights and search and rescue. And the enablers for this is, of course, then to go digital. Um, with digital solu solutions, we have fewer buildings, you have less to maintain. But also, we need to standardize on technology and, and systems and standardize on operations. Um, uh, this again, uh, uh, we will need the more flexible rostering. And of course, then at the end of this, the multi airport service provision. With the multi, we will get the, the we will reach the, the, the goals of reducing the operational costs. Uh, today we have uh, uh, several towers with a lot of local differences, and that gives less efficiency. Uh, there's a multitude of uh, legacy systems. Uh, these uh, old towers or traditional towers have been built over uh, several years. They are all uh, built with the technology at the time they were refurbished uh, some system have been changed uh, of course and are, are the same in all towers but but each and every tower look differently uh, and we have a lot of airport specific differences uh, and also unit specific differences uh, and and this also uh, is shown by by a lot of different interfaces in HMI and we need a lot of of local training local procedures uh, and, and not two towers are the same today uh, when we operate the towers, although we own all the towers and we operate um, uh, most of the towers ourselves, a few, a few is operated by others, but, but uh, nevertheless they, they will look different and they do work differently. With remote towers we remove those constraints. Uh, the remote tower program in Avenue, which I will talk a bit on uh, at the end, is about getting 15 airports for the first phase into the remote tower center, the main remote uh, tower center. There we will have 16 working stations, always one in spare, uh, which are all the same. If you take out all the old legacy systems, you change both the, the we take all the existing the uh, ATM system and consolidate into one screen uh, with one uh, HMI, and it's the same HMI for all the airports. Uh, of course, there is a local adoption to whatever uh, sensors are at that specific airport and, and the runway light setup, etc. But the HMI, the basic HMI, is the same all over. And especially when it comes to the electronic flight strips and the surveillance, that will be exactly the same for all the airport. Same uh, capabilities, the same training, the same uh, the same operation for all airports. And also these um, working positions in this new center will all be flexible. Uh, they are the same. You can take whatever role you like and just log on. Uh, there is no not so that one specific working position is linked to one tower. This is all flexible. So we're going to start up in in a single operation in the center, and that's why we have the sixteen uh, working positions uh, for fifteen airports. Uh, but of course, our goal is to then start with two airports in multi operation, and then eventually with three airports in multi operation in that center. Uh, and with that, we will be achieving cost um, benefits. Um, to do so, we need to have 
multiple aerodrome endorsements for each individual working in that center. Uh, that we have started already, although multi-software is still uh, uh, a bit ahead of us, we start with the uh, multi-aerodrome endorsements because that will also give us more flexibility in single mode. With the operators having more than one endorsement, we can train, we can, we can plan, we are more robust when it comes to single operation. And it could also be times a day where, where we could do what we call sequential mode, where one operator could still operate two airports, but then only one at a time. But of course, multiple uh, aerodrome endorsements is the key enable for multiple mode. Uh, and uh, and uh, to do so, we will have one unit training plan and as few local differences as possible. Um, that's part of the remote uh, program is to now make those um, tower operations as equal as possible. So the same tools, same basic HMI for all aerodromes and common unit operational procedure as far as possible. Of course, there will always be local uh, adoptions when needed, but if not needed, we will do it the same. Now, so the remote tower program in Avinor is uh, the world's largest remote tower program. We um, started off uh, and uh, have a mandate of procure, develop, and uh, eventually then install a remote tower system to 15 airports in Norway. And that's including all the needed infrastructure. We're building uh, two centers, one main center and one contingency center, all in both placed in, uh, in Buda. Uh, and in 2015, we signed a contract with the Kongsberg Group uh, with uh, Indra and Avia as a sub supplier uh, for the ATM uh, part of the, of the solution. Uh, we worked then uh, hard with the, with the suppliers, and in um, uh, October 2019, we could take the first airport into operation in the contingency center. And a year later, we took th uh, three more. So all in all, we have now four airports remotely controlled from the contingency center. And the picture here is the main center and that will go operational in May this year. Uh, and we hope that we will have all 15 airports by the end of 2023 uh, in this uh, center. <coughs> uh, the main center, uh, as you saw, is, is now uh, built. We are, uh, we have set up all RTMs to handle up to the 15 um, uh, airports. Um, this center is now uh, in the final stage of uh, testing. We have conducted both the FAT and the SAT on the software. Uh, we have done the passive shadow mode, and we are now doing the last week of stability tests on the on the software. So all in all, this center is now ready to be put into operation and we'll do so early in, in May. Um, starting off in single mode, um, as I said, uh, the position in front here where, where people now are just uh, sitting with the laptops, that will be the uh, operational supervisor position when we go into multi-mode, then, then we will uh, build up the supervisor position and the supervisor will have line of sight to each and every uh, uh, RTM and an operator within this uh, within this building. So what we're doing in the SSR validation now will be the next move in the center where we then uh, upgrade it, so to speak, to to go into multi operations. Um, a few more pictures from the from the center. Uh, we really believe the center will be a a really good place to work, we are able to, to bring in a lot of um, uh, people to work together here. We have a, a strong, um, uh, we have 
uh, hopefully also of, of good discussions among the, the, the workers and we will we, be able to build a much more flexibility and robustness into the operation in this center than, than what we have today in the individual um, towers. So all in all, we are looking very forward now to uh, to the next step with the uh, with the multi. We're running forward with the single operation, and that is looking really good. Uh, standardizing, um, uh, preparing for multi, and then the, exactly when we will start with with multi operation will depend on on the both readiness of the the software and also the approval of the of the authorities. Um, but we are moving forward and, and eventually we will be able to run all the 15 airports in multi-operation from this uh, site within hopefully not too long. So thank you for your uh, attention here and of course I will join further on to be able to answer any questions uh, you have. So Martin, back to you. Thank you very much, Yonara. Very excited to, uh, to see the center and uh, the large operations. I believe this is the world's largest remote tower project uh, at the time. So it will be uh, interested to see one multi also can be taken into use here. Uh, then we're going to move on. I should mention that uh, I forgot to mention that uh, the webinar today is being recorded. Uh, we haven't really decided uh, whether that can be uh, made uh, publicly available due to GDPR and other reasons, but uh, we'll see how that is. But we are recording the session today. The next speaker is uh, Chava Gagli from Hungar Control. Hungar Control has been uh, operating a remote tower for, for a long time, and Chava is a senior advisor ATM. You could take over, Chava. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm trying to share my uh, screen to you. Uh, if I can do that, then you will be able to see my screen. Yes. So, um, welcome from Budapest, uh, from Hunger Control Headquarters. I will give you a short summary of what we did in uh, the last uh, past years uh, within the CESAR uh, activities regarding uh, multiple remote uh, operations. As you can see, Hungary is a small country in the middle of uh, Europe, and although we are a small country, we don't have uh, as many uh, airports uh, at the countryside as other countries have, but still we have some, and a few of them uh, with uh, international traffic, scheduled traffic. Therefore, always uh, be in a willingness from the government to serve these uh, airfields uh, by uh, air traffic control service to provide However, due to the very low amount of traffic, it was not financially feasible so far. Therefore, we still trying to find the correct way to provide service for these uh, small airfields. As you can see uh, on the map on the left hand side, we have a quite uh, small, uh, tiny white spot uh, south of Hungary, where we are providing uh, the uh, ATC service for the upper upper airspace for Kosovo from Budapest. So we now do have uh, a remote airspace and also we do have, as you may know, a remote tower for Budapest airport itself. On the right hand side, uh, you can see some numbers in nutshell. And of course, these numbers uh, are prior COVID uh, numbers. Back in 2019, we had these uh, numbers for our traffic. Um, we have a strategic program uh, for implementing uh, remote tower service and the first uh, stage for Budapest Airport, which uh, installation was uh, going live back in 2016. And since then, 
we gathered uh, quite a lot of experience in uh, different uh, conditions, different weather, different traffic situations. And uh, now we have gathered more than 3000 live hours uh, controlled from our uh, remote tower installation for Budapest Airport, which is still a uh, single and one and only live installation worldwide serving uh, dual runway uh, medium size and uh, traffic volume airport. Uh, most of the operation from this uh, facility was in uh, good visibility conditions using the cameras uh, because in low visibility procedures uh, there is no, no need uh, to use cameras as uh, you don't have uh, a visual control for the traffic. Most of the time we had uh, URM operations which uh, made the work, work more complex and uh, increased the, the work, workload for the controllers. Uh, we do not have uh, too many VFR traffic and therefore the system itself was uh, focusing uh, and designed to serve IFR traffic. Uh, that's what we have uh, mostly at Budapest Airport. During these hours, uh, we had uh, emergency situations on hand uh, and uh, served uh, perfectly. We had uh, many training flights, especially during the uh, low traffic volume periods uh, last year and this year uh, in, the, in the COVID uh, situation. And also, we are facing uh, almost daily with uh, different airspace and uh, airport uh, taxiway runway closures, which also increases the difficulties for the controllers. But so far, uh, all the operations went uh, smoothly and uh, safely. Uh, multi report operation. Back in 2017, we started uh, to deal with multi-remote operations within the CESA PG05 uh, project. Uh, at uh, that time, we've been uh, participating in uh, cooperation with uh, Frequentis and DLR. We had this uh, live uh, simulation in uh, Braunschweig at DLR, including three airports uh, from Hungary. Uh, one was uh, Budapest with a simplified configuration and we've chosen just one runway of Budapest Airport. Uh, the other was uh, Debrecen, which is uh, located uh, eastern of uh, Hungary, east, east bank of Hungary. And the other one was Papa, which is a military airport. So these uh, different uh, style and different tra traffic volume airport uh, were chosen uh, intentionally. And uh, of course, at Budapest, we had the SMGCS coverage, which gave a lot of uh, extra information for the controllers. And the uh, reason behind was to get an impression uh, how uh, can it be difficult for a controller to handle uh, three airports with uh, tr different level of equipment and different level of traffic volume. At, those at that time, in those days, we've been facing uh, and focusing uh, on the limitations of an air traffic controller. Uh, what could be the limitation of the traffic volume, the traffic intensity uh, to be handled uh, simultaneously for three airports? And the aim was to reach uh, three movements per hour uh, for uh, the three airport uh, altogether. And uh, at that time, we did not uh, had uh, special uh, circumstances like uh, emergency situations, but still there were some difficulties uh, during the simulations, which went I would say quite uh, smoothly and as expected. Uh, so therefore we went on with this project and uh, we made a passive uh, shadow validation uh, at Budapest uh, after uh, installing the camera systems for all the three airports and uh, controlling the passively monitoring the traffic, not controlling, but monitoring uh, from the 
uh, central lines the control of working position. The le lessons learned, uh, the usability, situational awareness and uh, the procedures. We got uh, a better understanding and better knowledge uh, how these, these kind of operations with the multi remote can be uh, increase uh, situational awareness, how and what conditions to be uh, needed for the controllers to handle the traffic uh, safely and uh, what requirements towards uh, not only the uh, technical system itself, but uh, the procedural and the training side for the human uh, staff to provide the service uh, without uh, any issues and uh, increasing the safety. So, uh, last year, we went on with this project with uh, in cooperation with Indra. And uh, last November, we had a simulation in Oscar at uh, Indra's headquarter. Uh, we provided the solution 35 with uh, multiple remote tower planning using the planning tool provided by Indra. And uh, we had quite a lot uh, lessons learned during these simulations, uh, the results uh, will be introduced later by my colleague, uh, Ms. Fanny Kling. And also, uh, we had uh, Solution 97 uh, simulation using uh, homework controls uh, developed, in-house developed uh, automatic speech recognition system, also in cooperation with Indra. Uh, and the details of this uh, speech recognition system will be presented to you later by my colleague uh, Victor Horvath. So uh, we had real real time simulation in Oscar last year and in this year we will have a passive shadow mode validation in Budapest also using a live camera feed from uh, three different airports at the countryside and we are, we've been uh, installing a control of working position in uh, Hungara control headquarter in Budapest. So back to the uh, live simulation details. Uh, as uh, Martin was uh, mentioning, we used the same uh, installation what Avinor used, uh, but we had our own uh, controllers with the background of several years uh, controlling uh, traffic in Budapest airport. And uh, some of them, they never provided service for a small airport with, uh, with only VFR traffic. So they did not have experience with, uh, with too many uh, VFR traffic and, and helicopter movements, but still uh, all of us uh, successfully managed uh, traffic in the simulator despite the emergency situations and uh, system failures. What was new, the planning functionalities and the supervisor uh, functionalities as uh, not all of the controllers uh, got the supervisor uh, uh, legislation in, in the Budapest Tower. So it was quite a new feature. We used the uh, tool developed by uh, Indra. Uh, the tool was very supportive and we gathered a lot of useful information how to manage the allocation of uh, the traffic between the controller working positions and we got some unexpected results, which will be uh, presented to you by uh, Fanny later. So these are the, these, these were the airports. We had four Norwegian airports, which uh, in the initial hours uh, caused some more uh, workload for the controllers because uh, those airports and the specialties, uh, the local conditions for those airports were quite uh, unknown, but still uh, it was quite easy to, to get used to the system and to, to get used to how to handle the traffic, especially for those who attended on the first wave uh, simulations in Braunschweig. So uh, in the nutshell, that was my presentation. 
and the result you will be uh, get later on from my colleagues. Uh, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Chawa. Very interesting to hear. Uh, we will now move on to uh, the next part, talking about automatic speech recognition. It will be presented by Georgi Mbalog and uh, Viktor Horvat. But before they start, we'll show you a short uh, introduction video to this topic, which is a new topic to to us and to, to many, uh, automatic speech recognition in ATC environments. So then I'll switch over to the video again. Hi Siri, text mum, I'm on my way. Virtual assistants can make life easier by managing everyday tasks based on voice commands. In air traffic control, voice commands are essential for ensuring flight safety. But unlike the virtual assistants on smartphones, the voice commands need to be manually registered into the tower system. That may be about to change. Indra is working with Hungaro Control in an exploratory project funded by EU's CESAR joint undertaking to develop automatic speech recognition aimed at air traffic control. The goal is to reduce the workload of the air traffic controller. The system recognises verbal instructions related to a specific flight and automatically converts them to inputs to the tower management system. This eliminates the need to manually enter the instructions in the system. The principle is simple. The air traffic controller gives a pilot a command through Indra's Garrett's voice communication system. A module developed by Hungaro Control interprets the spoken words and converts them into call signs and commands in text form. The text is converted to actions in Indra's Innova electronic flight strip and tower system. Scandinavian 4558, line up runway 07. Line up runway 07, Scandinavian 4558. Automatic speech recognition saves time for the controller by reducing manual registration of commands. The controller can focus on more essential tasks, improving flight safety and operational efficiency. North Shuttle 15 Tango Kilo. Runway 07, clear for takeoff. Wind calm. Clear for takeoff, 07, North Shuttle 15, thank you. The future of air traffic control is digital. Embrace the progress. Yes, then I'll give the word to you, Gyogi, to present more about this uh, area. Thank you very much, Martin. Good afternoon, everyone. Give me a second uh, to start my presentation. So uh, let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the automatic speech recognition, uh, which is uh, a part of the CESAR 2020 Wave 2 PGO5 Digital Technology for Tower project. This ASR is a part of the Solution 97 HMI interaction modes for airport tower. And the automatic speech recognition in this solution is supported by AI or machine learning algorithm. This, as it was mentioned earlier, was a technical validation together with Hungaro Control. And the validation platform is exactly the same as uh, what we used in Solution 35. It was a joint validation. Uh, but uh, we didn't use multi-setup, we used one airport only. What you see is Budo Airport uh, on the simulator and the Innova heads down. The validation platform itself, including the ASR module, uh, which is developed by Hungaro Control, and uh, my colleague from Hungaro Control, uh, Viktor Horvat, will, uh, uh, will uh, tell you some more details about it. It's also including a command predictor, which is an in-house development of Indra Navia, including the Indra Innova Tower system and the Garex uh, voice communication system, and also a best simulator. Uh, as I mentioned, the ASR prototype module will be described by uh, Victor, 
So I would like to talk a little bit about the common predictor. We decided to uh, use machine learning and implement the common predictor. This common, uh, uh, why, uh, why we choose the machine learning? Um, because it may improve the quality of the uh, contextual information. Yes, uh, but how uh, can this ASR performance uh, be improved? By assisting the ASR with contextual information about the current uh, flights, uh, uses the experience data to pred predict the next clearance for current flights. This is uh, what is called assistance-based speech recognition. And how it is work? Builds the experience by continuously monitoring and logging contextual information like flight positions and destination, the type of flights, clearance is given, or visibility conditions. It is uses the prediction to evaluate the plausibility of clearances given by the speech recognition engine. Favors recognize clearances with high plausibility and may reject others. Let me show you some details about the validation platform. This is the Innova heads down, which is including an electronic fly strip board and an ASR recognition window. With this setup, we validated different automatic speech recognition use cases. These use cases are the following. Highlight of recognized call sign. Showing full recognized command on the HMI. Manual manipulation of ASR output. And automatic acceptance of ASR output. How we did? Let's uh, see uh, some examples. If you see the frame around the cosine, it shows the, uh, the cosine highlight, which is one of the use cases. Also, when the cosine is recognized, it's not just highlighting the cosine on the electronic flight strip board, but uh, on the ASR recognition window, the cosine uh, will be presented in front of the controller. Exactly the same how when the clearance is recognized. The clearance is recognized and also the parameter which belongs to the clearance. And if you see the difference, here is the flight is in is in the airborne bay, but when the uh, when uh, the clearance is executed, then it is an automatic action without any manual intervention, and the strip will move from the airborne bay to the ground bay because the clearance is executed. Let's have a closer look of the ASR recognition window. This is how it looks, containing some information. As you saw earlier, the recognized call sign, the recognized clearance, the parameter, which belongs to the uh, recognized uh, clearance. In this case, the 07 is the runway direction, but also have some other information. For example, a time timer, which countdowns for five seconds before the clearance is automatically accepted. This is a configuration parameter, so it can be set to any other value. If the controller is not happy with the recognized uh, uh, clearance, then can reject within this five seconds. And also, it's possible to accept the clearance within this five seconds. So in the next minute, uh, I will show you a short video. Scandinavian With some examples. Four, five, seven, three, runway 07, clear to land, wind calm. Clear to land, runway 07, Scandinavian 45. You see the call sign highlights. Scandinavian 4558, taxi to holding point alpha, runway 07. Taxi to holding point alpha, 407, Scandinavian 864, startup and pushback approved, QNH 1006. Startup and pushback approved, uh, 1006, Vidro 864. Scandinavian 4573, runway 07, clear to land, wind calm. Clear to land, runway 07, Scandinavian 4573. Scandinavian 4558, taxi to holding point alpha, runway 07. Alpha 
Scandinavian 4106, runway 07, clear to land. Here you will see the automatic, uh, sorry, the manual acceptance of the recognized clearance. North Shuttle 15 Tango Kilo, taxi to holding point Alpha, runway 07. This is a wrong recognition, so the controller rejected. North Shuttle 15 Tango Kilo, taxi to holding point Alpha, runway 07. Scandinavian 4106, go around. I say again, go around. And this clearance is also rejected because the aircraft already received the landing clearance, so it was just like a Scandinavian example. Scandinavian 4455, startup approved. It was a very short introduction of the ASR, so thank you very much for your attention. And I will give the word now to uh, Viktor Horvath, who will give you more details about the ASR module, how it works. Thank you, Georgi. Good afternoon, everybody. I share my presentation with you. Um, I would like uh, to give you a short um, introduction of the automatic speech recognition, the ASR module that uh, was developed uh, in close cooperation with the uh, Indranavia for the Cesar PG05 solution 97.2. But before I'm doing that, I would like to give you a short uh, background of the uh, ASR development happened uh, in hunger control. So we started back in uh, 2018 when uh, ASR technology um, has been considered mature enough to have um, ATM specialized uh, focus uh, um, uh, use case which supports um, ATM uh, simulations, ATC simulations. Um, and uh, we developed uh, 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 the ASR solution in scope uh, with the IKO Docker 4444, which is a standardized, um, uh, which uh, standard for, for uh, ATM uh, phraseology. And um, we have a really ambitious use case uh, for that, the virtual pseudo pilot platform, um, which yeah, it's working in, in simulations environment. It's a really important, it's, it's not an operational environment. And um, this is a software solution uh, which uh, can recognize the uh, issued command issued by the ATCO. Uh, it can read back uh, the command or the, the response, the read back on frequency, and it can handle data input uh, into the simulator itself. So it is working basically as a pseudo pilot, a human pseudo pilot, uh, but uh, with the power of ASR um, in the, in the, under the hood. Uh, we have been kept in mind that uh, the human in the loop activity is really important uh, from the point of view of the real time simulations. That's why we kept a super supervision interface. We implemented the supervision interface um, for um, having human in the loop. Any any uh, misunderstanding can happen with with the ASR and uh, these uh, slight uh, Misunderstandings can be corrected by by humans in the in the in the pseudo pilot room. So this is the the use case that we targeted back in 2018, and the goal was uh, really obvious. It's a, it's a cost reduction. Uh, it can result a good cost reduction in uh, during uh, different RTS uh, situations like testing. Sometimes we do not need as many pilots as required for uh, uh, full-fledged simulation during testing, but the pilots usually there and um, they are not um, um, participating uh, deeply in the in the activities of, of the testing. Or for example, uh, for trainings, we can use uh, uh, this virtual solo pilot platform. For example, when the radio telephony is 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 uh, the target for the air traffic controller trainees how to how to say something on the frequency correctly 
So it's, uh, we started the journey uh, to find a suitable ASR technology and we targeted the IKO hybrid language, which is a kind of English with, with modif modified pronunciation. These modifications that you can see uh, uh, is because um, to reduce the risk of, of, uh, mis uh, of mistakes or switching or, or misunderstanding uh, letters or words, phrases, which um, can lead to unwanted uh, situations and, and um, problems in, in uh, air traffic control and of course in the simulation, of course. And uh, we identified that the phraseology is based on strict rules. So according to these rules, it can be programmed. In the table below, you can see the comparison between two different ASR uh, solutions. Uh, the free speech ASR is, is really good for natural language processing. And uh, this, uh, this kind of ASR is usually working online as a cloud service like, like uh, Siri or Google Assistant. They are both uh, based on cloud services. And the drawback, the really, really important drawback is that they are not adaptable. They are as is, they are created for natural languages. And that's why uh, it, it cannot be applied to recognize this IKO hybrid language with, uh, with modified pronunciations here and there. So that's why obviously we chosen the predefined vocabulary solution for the ASR, which is great for this purpose. Uh, it can operate uh, offline as well, which means uh, it's possible to embed the ASR core into, into a software solution and it's fully adaptable. All the vocabulary and all the phonemes, which basically make up the words uh, which, which are spoken. So finally, uh, we after after um, market research, we we arrived our current uh, and applied solution, which is Nuance Walk-on Hybrid, and this is a modular and scalable ASR engine. Not just ASR, it also includes a text-to-speech synthesis, so it has the the other way around. And uh, this is an embedded solution, and uh, the pre-programmed vocabulary can be can be extended and um, the software itself can be developed around the ASR core through its, uh, its SDK, powerful SDK uh, for adaptation. And it may sound that we are arrived and this is done and problem solved, but <laughs> the problem starts uh, here because we have a really, really uh, great challenge. The incomplete vocabulary and the inaccurate phonemes uh, can lead to false recognition. And that's why uh, the, to improve the, the recognition rate, we have to carefully and extensively prepare this, uh, this uh, pre-programmed vocabulary and the phonemes, and uh, we have to test throughout. And uh, speaking of the ASR module developed uh, with, with Intranavia for this uh, Cesar solution, uh, here you can see on the right hand side a block diagram of how the ASR module has been has been uh, interfaced with, with GARX voice communication system and uh, with Innova uh, modular remote tower HMI. Um, so basically the ASR module receives um, audio streams from the GARX voice comm system and the ASR engine um, recognizes the, the, the speech and the result then uh, forwarded to the MRTM uh, with, with uh, a couple of information about the recognition result. And um, during this uh, validation exercise, we um, implemented a limited tower vocabulary uh, because, uh, of course, uh, it was it was a remote tower exercise. And here are a couple of features which has been introduced, uh, as you have seen it on the video. Uh, I think uh, it was really visible the on the fly call sign recognition. So when when Georgi started uh, the the command but not finished the command, uh, the, the system already recognized the, the track or the flight 
uh, and the cosine has been already highlighted and um, displayed in the ASR uh, interface also. This module um, supports a parallel operation for multiple active GARX channels. We uh, use two channels for the validation exercise, but it, it can be scaled uh, more. And uh, we implemented an extensive logging in, in, into the module uh, to ease the way uh, how the the logs the the um, I'm sorry <laughs> how how these log logs can be understood and um, after the exercise human factor analysts can can see more more details about what happened on the frequency. And last but not least, there was a really interesting uh, web-based user interface implemented for demonstration purposes only. Um, so it's really, really invisible. The ASR in, in this loop is really invisible. You are not sure what's happening under the hood, and that's why we introduced this demonstration tool to visualize uh, each and every single uh, element of an instruction and uh, to see what is the recognition rate of, for example, a uh, given call sign of, um, of, a, of a flight or uh, the rest of the command and the pieces of the command itself. I would like to introduce you briefly the ASR development team in Hungaro Control, Gábor Kispál and Roland Tihi, who put together this uh, solution. And uh, I would like to give some credit for them. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you, Martin. And please don't forget to ask anything in the in the Q and A session in the Microsoft Teams. Thank you very much. Thank you, Victor, and thank you, Georgi. We have already received a couple of questions in the Q and A feed, and we'll uh, come back to that in the Q and A session at the end of the webinar to answer those. So that's a very interesting uh, technology, which is again, it's an exploratory validation. So it's focusing on the technical part and not the operational part in this validation. It's quite early in the maturity process. We'll continue with the validation uh, platform. And I will talk about that, uh, the validation platform. We've seen some examples on it in videos and, and uh, also in the ASR. And uh, here, you can see in this uh, picture from the validation with Hungaro Control that we had two multiple remote tower modules, which are called MRTMs. So two of those in the validation, uh, each of them can show up to three aerodromes at the same time, and they were fully flexible. So any aerodrome could be shown on any display slots. And also the controllers could themselves select which aerodrome should be in this position. So that's the new thing in this uh, this uh, validation that it uh, the dynamic allocation both by the controller also between the controllers. Normally the controller themselves select which aerodrome to have, but there's also an ability for the supervisor to do that work. So we have the supervisor position. You don't see it right in this picture, but we have the supervisor position with some tools to assist the controllers in the remote tower center. Here you can see a schematic of the same setup with the two MRTMs at the top left and top right, where you see slots for three aerodromes on the heads up, the, the out of the tower window view. And then on the heads down, it's a single heads down screen. So that's a, an integrated tower screen uh, that provides all the ATM functions that you need for a tower for all the three airports on that single screen, except for the voice switch, the VCS is on a separate screen on the side. So we had two of those MRTMs and then one supervisor with a dual screen and a voice switch on the side. Connected was also four pseudo pilots in the in another room. They were controlling the aircraft and controlling vehicles and uh, responding as remote uh, destinations approach or fire service or uh, military or uh, the airport authority in the validations. So that was a part of the simulator to to be able to control all this. This picture shows a more uh, 
overview of the MRTM, you see the three different uh, aerodrome display slots the out of the tower views, and then the 43 inch touchscreen in front of the controller on the desk, and the voice switch screen on the side. The heads down screen is uh, a touch screen, but the controller could select whether they wanted to use touch or the mouse on the side there. The voice switch screen is a touch screen. So the out of the window view, the heads up is provided by the Micronav best simulator. So that provided a tower view for all the three airports you can see at the same time. The heads down screen is the part of the Indra Innova ATM system, and this is an ATM system that we provide for operational use, both for small towers and large complex towers uh, around the world. Also, the supervisor tools is a part of that uh, Indra Innova tower ATM system. The voice communication system use is the Indra Garex voice switch, and then as we just heard about from uh, Viktor and Gergi, the automatic speech recognition engine from Hungaro Control connected to this. So we've done further prototyping on all these elements to adapt to the multiple environment and uh, dynamic allocation. So when looking at uh, heads up, we have these three display slots uh, for the three different airports, A, B and C. And you see that the screens for the A display slot is a bit larger. This is to resemble uh, the implementation Avinur has in Bodø. You saw on the slides and the pictures that were shown by Jonari Petersen earlier that they had uh, larger screens. And in the multi setup there, the A slot will have a 360 degree view, while the B and C slots will have a 180 degree view. Uh, in this validation for the simulator, we had a 180 degree view on all the three slots. The ABC uh, setup is the same on the heads down. So the lower uh, aerodrome A is on the lower, both on the heads up and heads down, the same with the upper left and upper right. Uh, the heads down, as I said, has support for up to three aerodromes. You see the, the background is a surveillance picture. And uh, these aerodromes that we simulate uh, in the validation, they don't have any ground surveillance in real life, so we didn't provide any ground surveillance in the validation. Most of these smaller airports don't have that, so we only have air surveillance and we had uh, limited the air surveillance to above 300 feet. But we have the surveillance picture, so all airports had surveillance in the air. We had approach tools for the for the airport, one airport that we tested combined tower and approach. We have the electronic flight strips on the lower right side uh, of the screen there. We had met information coming from the simulator. We had the aerodrome selection panel where the controller could select which aerodromes to have on his uh, in on his uh, screen. It could be selected in view mode or in a full operational mode. And then a planning tool, which is new in this multi setting, planning tool, a timeline for the controller to to look at uh, how the traffic develops over time. So if we look closer at this uh, part in the lower right side, which we call the dashboard, the dashboard contains a the upper part is the timeline, which is the ATCO planning tool. And the planning tool shows uh, all the flights that are present and in the future as a line in the timeline. So you can see where, at what times you will have multiple simultaneous flights and, and by that get an assessment on the workload you can expect in the future. You have color coding, same color coding as you do in the flight strips to see what's IFR, VFR, arrivals, departures, etc. and get some more information. And the controller can select to what what time span he wants to look at, whether it's only the next 20 minutes or whether it's the next four hours. The lower part is the electronic flight strip uh, system. And it's divided into three here where you see the three airports separately. So we have a separate uh, EFS for each of the three airports. And because these are simple airports, we have a limited number of uh, flight strip bays. We have an airborne bay, a runway bay, and a ground bay, in addition to two pending uh, bays, pending arrivals, and pending departures. So you see the same color coding being used here, uh, and also for vehicles. 
and you can also expand these flight strips to get more information on the flights. And EFS is used to, to log the clearances given, lineup clearance, clear to, uh, clear for takeoff, clear to land, etc. And that will move the strips between the base. And that was done automatically with the speech recognition as we saw earlier. So this is the dashboard part of it. The voice switch also supports uh, communication with the three aerodromes, up to three aerodromes. And voice communication is an important part of this validation both for to see how the communication with aircraft and vehicles is, but also between the airports and use of, of aerodrome call uh, names in the call signs or in the in the clearances. Uh, the voice switch is also connected to the Innova system. So when the controller selects a new airport into his working position, the voice switch will also be automatically reconfigured and frequencies and direct access telephone keys will be added for that airport. So it's consistent. All the parts, the heads up, heads down, and the voice switch are, are uh, configured automatically. The tower, we separated between tower frequencies to talk to aircraft and vehicle frequencies to talk to vehicles. They were separate and they were also separately coupled in this validation. So we had one coupling group for all the tower frequencies between the three airports and another coupling group between the vehicle frequencies. And for the controller, we provided a microphone with two buttons. So the upper microphone button, the orange one, uh, then you uh, transmit it to the air uh, tower frequencies to the aircraft, and using the black lower button, then you transmit it to the vehicle. So we wanted to avoid too much pressing and reconfiguring on the touchscreen itself. The controller could press either of those two buttons to transmit to either aircraft or to vehicles, which worked very well. And also, of course, the, the voice switch provided the simulated telephone connections to approach uh, to fire services, airport authorities, military, etc. And on to the operational supervisor working position. Uh, as I said, this is an important part of the validation, a separate objective as the, the supervisor role in a multi or in a remote tower setting at all is, is uh, new. So we wanted to see how that worked uh, and how we could support the controllers in that aspect, but also give the supervisor a way to plan the allocation of the remote tower center. He has to plan which airports to combine to a controller, when to split them, etc. And then he needs some tools. So we have developed through this uh, project some tools to test out in the validations. One is an overview tool where the controller or the supervisor has an overview of all the airports connected to the center, all the RTMs in the center, and how each RTM are now using uh, the airports. So which airport are now being used in which position, and also by which operator. And you can get some information about the runway in use, the meteorological conditions on the different uh, airports, etc. The supervisor also have the ability to see a surveillance picture and they can zoom in to any airport to see the traffic around that airport. They can have an alarm list for the center and the airports and also a planning function for the supervisor, which is an extended version of the one we had for the ATCO. So the supervisor is able to see the traffic for all the airports in the center and can also have combine uh, logically uh, different airports to see how that works in the future. So that's a, a what if function for the supervisor to see what if I combine these two airports or these three, how will that work out in the future? And then I can plan how to, to merge or split aerodromes on the RTMs. We have the four aerodromes that we simulated in this uh, exercise, but we also added another 11 airports and 11 RTMs into the supervisor position so that the supervisor was able to, to work with 15 airports and 15 RTMs to see how that would work. So this was an interesting uh, exercise for the for the supervisor. And as I said, we had supervisor with experience from A to C centers as well as larger towers in the validations. To provide the, the out of the window view we, uh, and also the stimulation to the system, a very important part is the simulator. And we have a good cooperation with Micronav that uh, provide the best simulator for this. They have two versions of this, the best tower and the best radar. 
And in this uh, simulation, we use the best tower, but also the, the airspace from the radar to be able to simulate the approach functions. So Mark and I has provided the simulators for many years and are based in the UK and providing this for, for ATM uh, training and, and validation purposes. Mark and I have also developed uh, and further enhanced the product to be able to support this multi uh, concept. So the single simulator was able to provide uh, simulation data for four airports at the same time. And as you see, we had three physical screens showing each airport and we had one computer feeding those uh, three screens. And this was with a full 4K UHD resolution at a full 30 frames per second uh, update rate. So it, it demanded a quite a heavy graphics card to be able to, to provide this uh, level of detail, but it was very helpful. Micronav uh, made uh, models of all these four airports, both the ground space, airspace, but also the 3D uh, view of that uh, airport to be able to provide as much as realism as possible. In these operational validations, we put the controller in front of the system and to have the out of the window view with as much level of detail as possible is very important. That gives a more realistic impression. And especially with these smaller airports where we don't have ground surveillance, the visual part of it becomes even more important to be able to visually see where aircraft or vehicles are. And we also put into the exercises uh, situations where vehicles may be uh, didn't follow an instruction or an aircraft didn't quite respond as expected to see how that worked in a multiple setting when you have to divide your attention between multiple airports. So the, the fidelity and the, of the out of the window view is quite important. And it simulated very well the behavior of aircraft, the vehicles, uh, underground uh, features, but also the weather situation and light conditions. In one of the exercises with our control, we also simulated uh, low visibility procedure settings with, with, uh, with a lot of fog and, and difficult uh, visibility conditions. The interfaces between the simulator and the Innova was multiple. We had asterisk feed to provide the surveillance for all the airports. We had AFTN feed that provided the flight plans for all the airports and all the flights in the airports and individual feeds that provided MET information. So we also had changing MET, uh, QNH changes, wind condition changes, etc. during the exercises. Uh, we also had a scripting interface going the other way so that the Innova system could give commands to the simulator. And that was especially useful when selecting a new airport into the user position so that uh, the best simulator could then change the out of the tower view and adapt to the correct view. So all this worked very well uh, and all the exercises were pre-programmed into the simulator so that each controller could have run through the same type of exercise. But of course there are things happening and we also had pseudo pilots controlling the aircrafts and responding to the pilot to the controller's commands. The four aerodromes was mentioned earlier. Svartnes in the north, Bodø and Røst in the middle of Norway and Karme on the southwest coast, quite long distance away, about uh, nearly 2000 kilometers between south and north. And also a bit difference on the size and complexity of the airports. Bodø is the largest one. Uh, in real life, it's about 60,000 movements uh, per year and mostly IFR traffic, but also some helicopter, uh, rescue helicopter traffic. But as you can see, it's got a full parallel taxiway. Uh, so it's uh, all the taxiing can be done on taxiways. Whilst on the other three airports that you see here, they have just a connection from the apron to the runway. So then the aircraft had to do a back uh, taxi or, or or uh, to line up and to uh, after landing. So then the aircraft used more time on the runway, which is more complex for the controller because you have to take that into account, the runway occupancy time. So not only the number of movements drive the workload, but also the complexity and the layout of the airports. I'll show you a short video demonstration of the platform and how it was used. And then I'll stop this and I'll
turn over to a video. At first in the video, you see a uh, single operation. So we have one airport, which is Bodø, up and running. And you see on the background the aircraft taxiing. And uh, on the heads down display, we have the single airspace. And you can also zoom into an inset window into details. But again, we didn't have surveillance on the ground in the validation. You see MET information on the floating window to the left. And you see the dashboard with the with the different flight strips. Then we add a second airport, select from the menu, press OK, and then you see the screen splits. A new airport is added on the heads up, and now we have a two airport situation, one at the top and one on the lower. So those are independent. Uh, and you can zoom in and pan as you like and see the traffic on those two airports. Also individual MET windows where you can open and close. Then we'll add the third one. You see the list here. But you can just select it and confirm it. And you see also that you can select whether you want to operate or view only to the right in the picture. In this uh, example, we have taken right into operate, but in the validation handover, you first take it into view mode and then you get acquainted and then you do a handover to operate the airport. So now you see that the third airport is being displayed on the heads up and also on the heads down on the upper right side. So now you're operating on three aerodromes on this uh, on this MRTM. And you also had three aerodromes in the dashboard to the right with the EFS, etc. And you can also see the traffic on the three different aerodromes. So now the controller has to divide attention between the three. You can have taxing aircraft, you can have aircraft taking off and land at the same time on the three different. So the human factors things and aspects come strongly into uh, mind here. When the traffic increased, and hopefully the supervisors who detect that before the traffic becomes too much, then you can split one airport and send it over to another position. And as I said, normally you take it up to view mode on the new controller, the new controller that can then look at the traffic, see the traffic on the heads down. And when the two controllers agree, they do a handover and the new controller will take the airport into operations mode. And then it still stays in view mode on the old controller's uh, position. Now we'll show as an example on when you swap position of two airports, we're going to swap the upper right position, the rest airport, to the lower screens so that Bodø goes to the upper right again. That's also done. There is so now Bodø is on the upper right screens and the rest on the lower screens. So that could be if you want to use the, the larger screens to, to a, uh, an airport with more traffic, for instance, or a more complex operations at that point. So this is totally dynamic. Now we'll swap it back. We'll see that in a second. It swaps back to the to the previous setup. There you are. The next example is that after you've handed off an airport to your fellow uh, colleague, then you can close the airport or remove it from your uh, screen. And that is simply done by clicking it out and confirming that you want to stop operating it on your screen. And then this RTM goes back to a two aerodrome operations mode, again with the two on upper and lower on the side here and the same on the heads up. So this is totally flexible for the controller and they can also move the division lines on the heads down between the airports if you need more space on the heads down. Of course, with using a single screen, the, the space on the heads down screen is, is important to manage well. That's why we have a very flexible setup on that part. So that shows the, the platform. Then we'll move over to the validation execution. And uh, you give me a second, I'll give the word to Tristan and uh, you can start uh, showing that how that was done in Avenor, Tristan. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm just going to load on the presentation. Should come now. 
So my name is Tristan Blanbrud. I am working as a human factor specialist, both for this uh, Cesar project and for the remote tower project um, in Avino. So I will present to you how the, um, the validation, uh, Avino or Indra's validation uh, was conducted. I will start with uh, a reminder, introduction of the objectives uh, we had for validation. So we had a set of um, common objectives for both the uh, ADCOs and the supervisors uh, that were agreed among uh, partners uh, of the same uh, validation. So here you can see the different uh, validation objective topics. So uh, workload was one of the topic to uh, validate that the workload uh, can be maintained uh, at an acceptable level. Another topic was the situation awareness, uh, that uh, situation awareness uh, also can be, um, is at a good level in this uh, context. That the HMI also uh, usability uh, and uh, utility is, uh, is good, so that uh, the uh, design is uh, efficient. Uh, also, operating, uh, we have validated that uh, the operating methods to handle multiple uh, aerodrome or supervise uh, uh, multiple aerodrome for the supervisor were um, efficient. We also uh, evaluated the roles and responsibilities so that the, the roles and the responsibilities for both actors, the ad cause and the supervisor, in this context uh, of multiple operations were uh, acceptable. We had also objective uh, related to the trust uh, in the system. And also we have, uh, we could explore um, an objective to explore transition factors. Um, that is to say, to identify, uh, try to identify uh, uh, training needs uh, or um, new competence uh, requirements. And uh, last but not least, uh, safety. So to uh, ensure that uh, safety was uh, maintained, uh, that uh, the ADCOs were able to uh, detect, for example, as other situation or uh, to manage that ADCO were able to manage uh, conflict uh, in that uh, context. Uh, and also that um, both uh, ADCO and supervisor could uh, collaborate efficiently to manage um, abnormal uh, situations uh, like emergency uh, or technical problem in uh, on a position. Uh, the next uh, slide uh, is about the participant. Uh, so we had four uh, at COS. So we had we had six two days session. Uh, for at COS in total, uh, that was for the Cesar validation because the Cesar validation is focused on uh, control aerodrome. But we also ha had uh, a, um, validation days with AFISOs since uh, for Avinor validation purpose, since uh, Avinor is also operating uh, AFIS uh, aerodrome uh, remotely. We had in total six supervisor, uh, two from uh, ACC and four from uh, big towers. We had four simulated uh, aerodromes, so the participant uh, at CO had, uh, uh, was, was supposed to have uh, endorsement to four uh, aerodromes. Uh, and we had two positions like uh, Martin uh, showed, so one position was manned by the participant uh, the ADCO participant and the other position was man, manned by uh, an ADCO uh, a part of the validation team to play uh, all the handover of aerodrome, uh, yeah, so to, <clears throat> to be able to play uh, all the, the, the scenarios. And then the, the supervisor had uh, an extra uh, 11 uh, uh, virtual aerodrome in addition 
So a total of 15 aerodrome for the supervisor to uh, to monitor. So the uh, the schedule for the validation, we had a two hour, uh, started with a two hour introduction and a two hour training. And then we had four, uh, five different uh, run, each run uh, lasting uh, one hour. And then we had at the end of days, uh, the debriefing and, uh, and a final uh, questionnaire. So if we look uh, a bit in to detail in the, um, in the different uh, runs and scenario. Each run was uh, focused on a specific topic scenario. So the first run, as you can see, was uh, focused on a merge a topic, so merge scenario, so merging um, aerodrome into the same uh, position. So the ADCO started with one aerodrome, uh, then had to open a second one on the same position and then um, received uh, a third one that was handed over by another uh, uh, ATCO. So of course the scenario was designed, uh, the traffic level was defined in a way to allow for uh, handling more uh, aerodrome into the into the position. And you can see on the the right column gives you an idea of the uh, of the traffic level for a maximum sim simultaneous movement for each uh, run. So the second run was focused on uh, split. Uh, so the at co participant started with uh, handling uh, three aerodromes simultaneously, and the scenario was uh, designed in a way, and the traffic level was defined. Um, in a way uh, to expect with uh, with uh, max with um, traffic exceeding a certain threshold uh, in the future, and so the expectation was that both the supervisor and the ATCO would see the need to uh, split uh, aerodrome, so to uh, for the ATCO to the need for the ATCO to end over one of the three aerodrome to another ATCO in order to make the, the workload uh, manageable. The third run was uh, dedicated to a scenario with a technical uh, failure on the position. Uh, so the expectation here was that uh, the supervisor will help the ADCO to move to, uh, another, to the other uh, position. So the supervisor could prepare also add the means to the tools to also prepare the other position, uh, which means to to load uh, to preload uh, the aerodrome on the on the new position. So the ATCO just uh, had to move from the position with the technical failure to the new position. And uh, to spice it up, we also added the uh, an expected and planned uh, endover of of aerodrome uh, due to fake illness of the of the other uh, ATCO, so the ATCO on the position uh, had to receive uh, a third aerodrome. So it was quite uh, yeah, uh, interesting. And the, the workload in, in that case was um, was quite uh, important for the for the operator. The roofs for the run four was uh, dedicated to a scenario uh, with an aircraft emergency. Uh, the ATCO started with three aerodrome. Uh, for the aircraft emergency uh, was leading to a diversion uh, of the aircraft in one of the aerodrome. So this, the expectation uh, was that the supervisor and the ATCO would agree that uh, the ATCO would only keep the, the aerodrome uh, where the aircraft emergency is uh, handled and end over the two aerodrome to ensure that the, the emergency situation um, can be managed. And that's what happened uh, in the in the validation. The last run uh, was a combined uh, tower. It was a run where one of the aerodrome uh, was combined uh, with uh, approach. This is uh, the different various traffic uh, 
that uh, we had and the different uh, conditions uh, situations that we had also. So we had some change, of course, and an expected situation to be able to measure the the, the, level, the situation or awareness uh, level, for example, or uh, to evaluate the safety uh, objectives. Uh, this is uh, an insight in the um, supervisor's task during the validation. Uh, since this role is quite uh, new, as Martin uh, mentioned, uh, so the the task for the supervisor was to, were to monitor the traffic load, especially in the future, to anticipate any potential overload with respect to a cluster capacity, so to a, to a remote tower module capacity. With we had uh, for the exercise, we we defined um, a rule uh, with uh, rule of uh, of eight simultaneous maximum uh, simultaneous movement with uh, VFR counting uh, as 1.5 uh, movement. So that was the rule of thumb for the for the supervisor. Uh, also to change, of course, the the task of the supervisor to change the allocation of aerodrome when uh, between RTMs and air operators uh, as necessary to support the transfer uh, of aerodrome between RTMs, like I mentioned, uh, case of technical failure in RTM, for example, and also to support operators to manage uh, the unexpected uh, situations. So that was also quite interesting because in, in, in big tower today we, we have, uh, they, they are, there is a supervisor, but in small tower there is no supervisor. So it's quite uh, important to define the role uh, of, the, of the supervisor in that context and the, and the task sharing between the, the supervisor and the ADCO in these uh, situations, uh, in unexpected situations in particular. To finish, uh, just a uh, uh, presentation of the data collection means. Uh, so we had observations um, during the run, video recording as well, post run uh, questionnaires just after the run, uh, in particular to assess the workload, the situation awareness for each run, and the briefing, as I mentioned, and also uh, post exercise uh, questionnaire. So the, the all the results for the different uh, objectives are currently um, under analysis. Uh, they will be presented in a, in a CSR report, of course, uh, towards the the uh, towards the end of the year, I think. Uh, but I'd be happy to answer uh, questions if you if any about uh, about the preliminary uh, results uh, during the the QA sessions. I'm done with the presentation. I will hand over the floor to you, Martin. Thank you very much, Tristan. Very interesting to hear about that uh, validation. And then we are closing on, on the last presentation. We will uh, hear from uh, Fanny Kling from Hungaro Control about uh, details from that uh, validation. Fanny, well, you can start. Thank you, Martin. Okay, just a minute. Okay, okay so, um, uh, my name is Fanny Kling. I'm a human factor specialist here at Hungar Control. Okay, thank you. <laughs> that's, that's okay. Um, and I'm working on the multiple remote tower project. Um, I've been involved from the wave one activities, but back then we haven't really focused on the supervisor position and the flexible allocation. So, um, so now this was our focus. 
Um, Chaba already mentioned um, some, uh, actually he has shown this slide, um, that we had a real-time simulation in Ashker uh, last November and December. It took two weeks and we had six hung um, Hungarian ATCOs in total um, with two groups, so three and three respectively. And, uh, and we had um, four Norwegian airports um, spread across the two MRTMs and also one supervisor position. And um, I was actually wondering that maybe I could uh, show you also some of the results because the analysis has been done. So let's take a look at the higher level results in terms of the workload. Um, this is the Bedford workload scale that shows you the, um, the workload um, averages. As you can see, we had four different scenarios. Um, the first one was a normal scenario. We also had an LVP and two non-nominal scenarios, um, the monitor failure and also the emergency. And as you can see from the figure on the left hand side, there are no significant differences between the, the workload averages and, and in every case the, the workload levels are within acceptable um, level. And also on the right hand side, you can see that I've broken down the results into MRTMs as well, because the experimental manipulations actually happened in MRTM1. So for instance, you can see that for the scenario three, MRTM, M MRTM1 had a significantly higher workload because this is where the monitor failure happened. In terms of the situation awareness, uh, well, the result is very similar. Um, the better, um, I mean, the higher the situational awareness level, the better. And this is what you can see here as well. So no significant differences um, between the scenarios can be observed and the situational awareness levels were um, within acceptable limits. But if we take a, a more closer look, um, we also asked the ATCOs that if their workload was um, high, then what were the contributing factors? And almost unanimously, they said that when they received a new aerodrome, the workload increased just for a few minutes because it took time to build up the situational awareness. And not just in terms of the traffic situation and because they had to coordinate um, between each other, um, but also because of the system and the system behavior. Um, because the thing is that the system, the way it behaved did not really fit their mental model. And this brings us to the second point, that whenever there was an aerodrome switch, you know, between the MRTMs or even just within the MRTM. So if the ATCO wanted to, to swap the positions of the aerodromes, the radar map shifted um, to a particularly odd position. So sometimes the EFS covered um, the, the new um, position of the, of the radar map. And interestingly, the mat window uh, remained on the same spot. So this uh, led to confusion and also a temporary loss of situational awareness. So because the, the system behaved as it did, um, actually ATCOs preferred to leave everything as it was, and they were pretty reluctant to move the aerodromes within the MRTM. Um, but it, in all fairness, it has to be said that the HMI and the, and the system has been tailored to Avinor's needs. So that just goes to show that what works in one setting may not necessarily be applicable in another context of use. So it's very important to also consider the, the environment in which it will be used and the, and the users who will work with the system. Regarding the split and merge, because this was also again something brand new for us, uh, we also asked what caused difficulties during split and merge. So if you take a, a look on the pie chart, you can see that in most of the cases, um, the workload remained at acceptable level during the split and merge, but there were some cases, some occurrences when the workload of the ATCOs were was pretty high, so the handover process um, led to some difficulties and sometimes even the supervisor had to jump in and help out um, for the ATCOs. But um, I would say that the split and merge was really, really appreciated um, and sometimes, uh, in fact, almost always, uh, ATCOs and the supervisors use this two by two aerodrome distribution um, because that really balanced the workload. And, and it made everything really, really smooth. 
Um, OK, so I was thinking that maybe I will not really uh, um, talk too much about the about the ATCO HMI because of the time limitation and we'll just jump right to the supervisor system, uh, given that the supervisor system is, is really uh, a focus here um, in this solution. So um, you can see that the uh, on the pie charts um, that the feedback was really positive. In fact, the supervisor system was highly praised. So I brought you also an extract from the feedback um, where they claim that the planning tool in the supervisor timeline is the best tool for a supervisor in an environment like this. It is really useful, although it could be a little more accurate. Um, there were some issues with the accuracy, but uh, but Atkos went to the MRTM and double checked uh, the traffic and made their decisions based on all the information that they could gather. And it was really nice that the that the supervisor system actually has shown this um, this simultaneous movement. And whenever it was above the threshold, which was uh, more than six um, simultaneous movement within the MRTM, then it turned to red. So it was quite visible that there will be some overload. In fact, uh, you can see here in this next slide that there is this yellow bar that we had also, which indicated the the overload periods within the MRTM. So the supervisor's situational awareness was really supported uh, by this system. So we also asked, uh, what would you say were the biggest challenges as RTC supervisor? And here are the, the um, things that appeared most often in the questionnaire. So to stay in my place and not to take part physically in the situation. Maybe bigger distances between the positions and direct phone lines would have solved this issue. Uh, and it is true that it actually came up quite frequently that the simulator was really small in the sense that the, the supervisors and the MRTMs were quite close um, to each other. So often the supervisor just stood up and went to the MRTM and, and observed the traffic and, um, and also helped out during the split and merge. The other one was to precisely identify the peaks. I needed to analyze the data provided by the system because the yellow mark periods were not real peaks in most cases. So that's true, there were some accuracy issues, um, but anyways, the, the whole system truly supported the work of the, of the supervisors. Um, and also uh, an interesting uh, one is the last one, to make ATCOs understand the need of splitting. Um, I really like this one because some of the ATCOs pointed out that when they um, when they um, controlled um, the in the MRTM the traffic um, and there was a, um, a, a supervisor decision to split, then they felt that it actually hurt their pride because they felt that they could actually continue uh, the work. They could provide still the the ATC to to the aerodrome, yet the, the supervisor made this decision. So it was it was also interesting to hear this from the supervisor point of view. Uh, another system recommendation was that the supervisor position should have a quick access for a view only radar, visual and voice function of any airport. In an emergency situation, there will be no time to walk to the MRTM position, so there should be a way for the supervisor to get as much information as possible about the situation without putting extra workload on the ATCO. So as you can see, there are some recommendations um, that we gathered from the supervisor um, and the ATCOs participating in the, in the validation. Uh, in terms of the roles and responsibilities, because this is also a very important part of the human factors analysis and also the skills that Tristan mentioned. So there were some, some, um, some feedback. Uh, one of them was that the sectorization was a little unusual for for our ATCOs because um, I don't know whether I've mentioned this, but out of the six uh, controllers, three of them are also supervisors at Budapest, um, but this is a medium sized airport and they don't need to sectorize um, there. So that was a that was a brand new um, brand new thing for them to to be really good at during the simulation. Um, they also mentioned that the supervisor should be confident in in their um, decision to split and merge because um, the supervisor is the one who has the absolute overview of the of the traffic within the RTC. So he should be the one to to make the call to split, and the ATCOs not necessarily need to question this. 
However, they also pointed out that because because the ATCOs are the one who who manage the handover process, um, they they should be involved and they should have the capacity to do that. So maybe it's very important. I mean, it's very important to find the time and the right time to to do the split so that they also have the capacity. And the last one was that uh, for the supervisor position, the roles should be defined because different interactions would be expected from a big center supervisor and from a two or three airport multi remote center. And this is actually what we have also shown that um, that in this setting, it was more like a smaller RTC, whereas a big center supervisor in a big RTC may have different challenges and may need different um, different skills. And the last slide, I believe, is the safety and split and merge. Um, unfortunately, Zoltan Moner, my colleague, um, couldn't be here, but uh, but it was really important that uh, when there is an additional aerodrome, the situational awareness um, is or will be temporarily lost and workload may increase. So therefore, as I said, it's very important that the timing of the split has to be um, very well thought out and uh, it should happen during the periods with lower traffic. Also, we have to provide sufficient time for the receiving ATCO to build up the situational awareness. Um, another uh, requirement or recommendation um, that the new aerodrome shall not mix up the layout of the HMI in such a manner that the ATCOs lose situational awareness. And also that moving the aerodrome with more traffic can be problematic. So the best, uh, the best was always when we switched the the aerodromes with the lower traffic, uh, so that the receiving ATCO didn't have a lot to to um, to get accustomed to. Whereas when we moved the the bigger um, aerodromes with more traffic, then it took more time and the workload was obviously a little higher for the receiving ATCO. OK, um, so that was it. Um, thank you for the attention. And if you have any questions, then I believe that we can come back to this in the Q&A. Thank you very much, Fanny. That was very good. Then I'll uh, we'll move on to the next part, which is the Q&A session. And we've had a few questions, so We'll start with one. How often had the ATCO, this is about the automatic speech recognition, how often had the ATCO to reject a wrong detected clearance percent? Was there a difference between incoming radio calls and calls by the ATCO? And maybe you could answer that one, Jodi. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, so um, as I briefly mentioned in the in the chat that uh, currently the data evaluation is in progress, uh, so uh, no percentage is available at that stage. And uh, because it was a technical validation, uh, we put a bit more focus on how the, the technology works and uh, the accept reject manual interaction was a bit like um, uh, driven by uh, by us, uh, less uh, by the traffic. So we several times asked the controller to accept or reject independently of the of the recognition. Uh, so I'm not sure how precise uh, information uh, we can uh, we can get uh, from the logs, uh, but uh, we have some dedicated uh, sessions when we were focusing only uh, only on what. Uh, uh, happens by the operation so uh, we have some dedicated um, uh, uh, logs when when we can grab this information the question is uh, how many of these uh, we will have at the end uh, but the rest of the uh, the rest of the validation was was more like uh, testing the system asking the controller to uh, to not interact with the system just let everything accept or just uh, reject as i said independently from um, from what uh, what happened uh, in the recognition side, so it's not easy really to to answer this question. And the other one is what uh, is the difference between incoming radio calls and calls by the ATCO? In this validation, we used only the ATCO radio channel, so we didn't uh, uh, we didn't uh, recognize the channel uh, of the pilot. So it means that um, the difference is that we have uh, data only from the from the ATCO side. 
Uh, this is a prototype and this is uh, uh, this is something very new for us. Uh, so uh, that was the very, very first implementation and the decision was made to 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 start with this implementation. Thank you. The next question also about ASR speech recognition in this case is just to get the log of the clearances, right? What happens about rejection of the recon? It's obvious it must learn from its mistake, but what else? And maybe Victor, you could say a few words about that. Yes, thank you, Martin. Um, yes, I tried to sum it up in, in, a, in a comment below the question. Yes, and uh, it's partially right, uh, but um, not, not completely true that uh, it's, it uh, only uh, transmits the log of the clearances because um, an, an instruction of clearance is, is, um, is described by uh, so-called ontology, which has a, which has a structure. And uh, to put it simple, the structure begins with a call sign. It, it has a main, main uh, clearance part, which is which is a category clearance category. We can we can uh, imagine it uh, that, uh, for example, uh, a pushback is is a, is a different category than takeoff. So we have we have a call sign, a main command or a main clearance, and uh, if there is any parameter paired with that clearance, for example, a waypoint or, or a runway or a parking position, etc. So these uh, are parts of a clearance which are uh, recognized individually. So all these elements has uh, their uh, recognition scores, uh, which shows the, the probability, probability of, of uh, successful recognition. And all this bunch of information is transferred to, to Indra system to, to handle and uh, to display uh, on, the, on the HMI. Uh, if there is a low uh, recognition rate, it's displayed uh, with red. It has a medium one, which, uh, which uh, turned out to be really exec acceptable during the um, the uh, the validation and if it's green then everybody knows it, it was perfectly recognized okay thank you i think we have time for just one more question and i think you know uh, maybe uh this is for you in terms of percentage is there an estimate of the total cost reduction with the use of a remote tower system <laughs> yeah. well that, that's a, a very good and very interesting uh, question of course um uh, first of all, I don't think we should, should go into our, our business case module in, in, in the meeting here, but um, what I can say in general is that, of course, establishing remote towers has a cost, uh, absolutely, and especially uh, for the first movers here. Um, the, there is an, an upside with the using of remote tower systems, and it comes from scale and it comes from uh, moving into multiple operation. So, so um, uh, I, I will not say a number in percentage here, but but there is a positive business case uh, of it uh, in terms of of um, reaching uh, in our case than fifteen airports and uh, and with the um, introduction of the multi. Uh, when it comes to the efficiency of the of the operators, we see that we can have approximately a 40% increase of the efficiency of the operators itself, but it comes with the costs of, of the technology and investments. So, so you can't transfer that directly to a um, to a business case uh, view. So um, uh, that might not be as precise uh, answer as as one uh, would like to have here but uh, it is positive and it it lies as I say in the in the scale of it okay thank you very much then we have one minute left and uh, i would just use the opportunity to at the end here show you two upcoming ssr validations we will also be having open days so in uh, March 2022, we will do another validation with Hungaro Control in another project, PGO2, which is uh, routing and guidance on the ground to look at follow the greens and how procedures on the ground can uh, detect and, and use conflicts. And uh, that will also be a real-time simulation. 
And then in April, as was mentioned uh, earlier by Chaba, we will have a validation in Hungary, in Budapest, with Indra camera system uh, installed on three different airports, and that will be a passive shadow mode validation. So we will look at real traffic and the controllers will deal with the real traffic and, and, and do that in a passive shadow mode validation. So both these uh, validations will have open days, physical open days, one here in Norway, in Oskir, 5th of April, for the routing and guidance, and one open day in Budapest, uh, 3rd of May. So we hope uh, everyone is able to come and see that. So then we thank you very much for this webinar. Thank you for all the presenters. Thank you for all that watched. And uh, uh, yeah, hope to see you again in the next physical event. Bye-bye.